All right. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the show. I'm so excited to introduce another wonderful guest. Uh, this is the great Leonard Schick, and he is a wonderful young musician. So much talent uh, at such a young age, and going to be definitely one of the great musicians to look towards in the future. Um, but really, so much talent, and I, I'm looking for these sorts of people. I'm always because I become a better musician when I talk to great musicians and I, I really, I learn a lot and that kind of knowledge, I really want to share that with the audience, great musicians, because I think the circle that you surround yourself with, and also that's a theme of what we're gonna talk about and Bach and his circle and who he also learned from. And, and I'm, Bach is not just an isolated person, he drew from many things. Um, but to take it back to Leonard, I mean, Leonard, welcome to the show. It's really a thrill for me to talk to you. Hello, Nicole. Thanks for the invitation. The pleasure is all mine. And uh, like I said early in the introduction, um, you're really, I think, um, I think people who are aware of you know that you are a talented improviser but, <laughs> and a talented musician. I mean, really, the, how, how rare is that to find? And, and I think... Um, I would. I definitely am interested in talking to talented musicians, and um, so maybe why don't we just start right at the beginning? Can you give me a little bit of your background? When did you get started in music? What age? What was your first instrument, and so on? So actually, my parents are musicians. Uh, my father is a double bass player. My mother, a pianist. Professional musicians, uh, classical music, but uh, not early music and not improvisation. Um, actually, I've always been interested somehow in um, Baroque music, but um, uh, how to say, my first interest was to play the violin and I, I took violin lessons. And besides that, I tried already to, um, to discover uh, um, things at the keyboard to... How old were uh, you? What age was this? When I was eight. Eight, okay. Okay. Yeah. So it was not... I mean, for 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 getting interested in, in, in Baroque music, it's already early, but it's not like four years old. Uh, kids right, right. <laughs> music. Um, yes, actually, I was uh, quite quickly interested in to the keyboard pieces by by Bach and um, I at tried eight, to, so at eight years old you were interested in Bach maybe at nine or ten but quite right. soon yeah. after try uh, uh, starting to take violin lessons and at the same time I also tried to to start to compose but it's it was more like uh, experimenting it was mm. not really um, following some some ideas but it was very soon going into that direction of uh, early music and um, actually I wanted also to, to really to play the, the music the keyboard music by Bach and uh, for me it was obvious that uh, it should be um, on the harpsichord because it was the instrument uh, mm. people had in the time and when I was 12, I started to take harpsichord lessons. At that time, I was already uh, composing quite, uh, quite a lot in early styles. Wait, I got to ask, are you Swiss or German? What is your uh, background? I'm Swiss okay. and uh, my parents are German. So I have uh, a bit two backgrounds, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you know, everything uh, go ahead. plays excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so um yes improvising was a part for me to uh discover the the composing techniques but actually 
it's it has not been a long time since I really consider myself also as an improviser. I would for for many years I would have avoided to improvise in front of people because um, I I was totally aware that my improvisation level was not first of all not as good as my playing level of repertoire and it was also not the goal I had but then. In Skoda, we have a very great um, improvising surrounding. And of course, with after composing a lot in early styles, playing basso continuo and all that stuff, I, the the step of do, doing it on a better level was already small, uh, re relatively small. So I tried but uh, to, to do that, but it came quite late. It came during my studies in Skoda in Basel. Uh -huh. So is it fair to say that uh, your strength at, uh, before that was playing repertoire? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, what is it about Switzerland? I mean, I have such respect for the Scola uh, Cantorum in Switzerland. I mean, amazing. I mean, they're churning out. I mean, the, there must be the right culture at that school because uh, they are, all the people who come out are creative. They're improvisers. They're composers. They are like not the usual modern classical musician. There's something different about uh, the s musicians who come out of that Swiss institution. Is that a Swiss thing or is that just because of the scola itself, the way it was, the culture there? I would say it's because of scola more than of Switzerland. Um, there was a, a very small scola cantorum for rather for amateurs at the, in Basel already uh, at the b beginning of uh, the last century. But um, then there was a, 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 somebody very rich, Paul Sacher, who came, who was founding a lot Skola, and it became, uh, over the years, thanks to that, uh, uh, a very important school, but it's not really related to Swiss culture or Swiss uh, uh, tradition of early music. And right, right. also, it's a special phenomenon because there are very few Swiss students there. They come from many... Paul, Paul like, Zaka? Exactly. Wow, he's a billionaire. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The yeah. third third richest person in the world. Oh wow! Okay, so, so he he basically he founded it and he he wanted to he wanted to uh, make a, a classical school in Switzerland. He was also interested in uh, modern music, but uh, I mean the implications now are that for us now are it's a very important school for early music in Switzerland but uh, there are not many Swiss people there it's very international and right. uh, it's also very interesting for that but uh, it's definitely a, a great place also right right and um, I mean I interviewed um, Two of your teachers, Professor Ru, uh, Rudolf Lutz and Professor Sietze de Vries, and uh, they both taught you. Is that right? Yes, uh, they they are uh, very great people. I never had uh, regular lessons with one of uh, both. I was uh, more than than once at master classes. Uh, each of them. Uh, Rudolf Lutz the first time already in uh, when when I was twelve, just before uh, starting to uh, take harpsichord lessons, um, I was very impressed um, also by his energy and his ideas. Um, Sitze de Vries was um, first time only three or four years ago, I think. Um, uh, he, 
it was very interesting because he really developed a kind of very uh, systematic uh, way of teaching improvisation and this was very fascinating because I was uh, very much in the process of um, uh, looking for systems which are really uh, sure to make to avoid mistakes to really uh, right. make something f uh, fluid and uh, fluent and not uh, 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 try and error on stage right right <laughs> um, well can I can I actually go a step back now this is improvisation did you have to learn basso continuo first before you was that something or I mean thorough bass or general bass is that something you worked yeah. on first before improvisation or is it at the same time somehow it's uh, it has been everything at the same time um, because when I started to um, take harpsichord lessons, I was already trying to compose, but the uh, the, the basso continuo was really uh, giving me the first uh, real technical um, rules and principles more for composition because I was uh, still not improvising really fluently. But um, this helped uh, definitely a lot and um, is a strong part of my, my improvisation background. Right, right. Now, uh, it's interesting because, you know, most uh, students, when they are become undergraduates at a conservatory, uh, they don't actually, basso continuo or figured bass, that's something that's kind of a specialty thing, right? It's for early music. Yes. It's for, they think, when most people, well, there's two things. One, one, they think it's only for Baroque ensemble playing and it's only mm -hmm. accompaniment. Uh, and then the other thing is, it's a, they, they consider it as a blend of Roman numeral analysis and figured bass. And that's the way I think in America, at least in North America, I believe, yes. most people look at figured bass. But you, you're looking at something a little bit more uh, closer to the way they practiced actually in that period, right? A little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you want to talk about that? Did you ever learn the other way that the more mainstream way, or did you go straight into this, the, the, the way that Bach might've used figured bass? Actually, it, 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 I was in a very uh, special situation because um, when I, when somebody explained me the Roman numerals for the first time really in a, a precise way, because before I was only uh, hearing sometimes something about it, but it was not that precise, so I didn't understand the principle. But when I really learned the principle, I was so used to basso continuo that... Um, it just felt too strange and too uncommon to me to be more interested in that. On top of that, the music I do are from the time before, so I had no reason to be more interested in it. Right. So right. Some, somehow I think you are right. I'm, uh, I, I learned it in a way which is closer to Bach and uh, people in his time. It's... Maybe it felt to 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 the people uh, in the 1720s when uh, Ramos' treatise came out. It maybe felt a little bit like I felt when uh, I heard for the first uh, time about the Roman numerals. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so then, um, so we, so the theory. So was that. What particular treatise did you did you have? Like I know there's the Germans and then the Italians and even mm -hmm. the French. They have different traditions. Did you use I don't know Heineken, Neat, uh, or what? What sort of uh, basis of uh, did, does the scholar use? Uh, I'm sure I've asked this before, but um, to <laughs> another guest. But what kind of uh, is it? Is it kind of a blend of different theorists? It is. There is a book which uh, was um, made by uh, Jesper Christensen, who was also my first uh, professor in Skola, by the way, um, which um, 
by harpsichord teacher used in uh, in Lausanne in Switzerland when I was uh, a teenager. Uh, it's a book which starts with the the um, book by Dondrieu, so it's a French treatise, mm. but it's a very um, a good treatise to begin because it's very systematic mm. and it gets slowly, step by step, very, um, more complex, but it's really, really systematic and really great for the, this. And then this book by Jesper Christensen, it builds up on this treatise and then it shows other uh, possibilities of doing in the other schools. I mainly learned with this. Uh, so this is uh, is uh, Jesper Christensen, is that right? Christensen, yeah. Okay. Is he Danish? Yes. Oh, okay. So this, this might be his Wikipedia page. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think so. Uh, yes. Okay, great, great. Uh, a music researcher in Basso Continuo. So his book, I mean, is it only... I mean, is it uh, in in German? Is it is it available for any English speaking people, or is it uh, just a text that's particular for that school? Can anybody buy it? I'm very curious to look at it. Yes, uh, anybody can buy it. It's, it exists uh, in French for sure, in English probably as well, because if there is a French translation, there must be an English one. Ah, okay. So it's uh, is this it? Eighteenth century. I think I've seen this before. Eighteenth century. This is. Ah, yeah. okay. Um, and so, what will you? Uh, does this teach you everything in Basu Continuo in terms of like, uh, kind of like, is it like a full treatise like C. P. E. Bach has his his kind of treatise as well, the true essay on the art of keyboard. Not totally, because it's actually more focused on eighteenth century. So all the very early stuff is is not there. Of course, okay. it's not complete to be a um, um, professional harpsichordist playing continuo for every kind of style. But right. uh, it's definitely a good way to start because there are uh, examples. There there are examples of all important treatises of this time okay okay is the germans so is there do you see the figures there's always figures on the base some is it ever unfigured or is it always with the figures uh it's sometimes unfigured and it starts very early on because dondrieu gives each example in three variants there's a first one which is uh not very realistic because there are figures to show the voice leading showing the three the third the the five the eight in the order of of where how to oh, play it in in the order of the voices that's great yeah and um and I then there's I a actually second... you know what it might be this right something yeah, like this exactly Okay. The second example. This is good is for so you're saying this is great yeah. for beginners, right? Because it gives you the yes. actual voices, the the hand position, yeah. the, every because it's yeah. it's not just the figures in the in the prime position. It's like you uh, it will tell you yeah. how to order it. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. The second is as you would find it if the score is well figured. The second example, the third exactly. So here you have. The sharps for the um, if you need a, a sharp because it's the first very fir first example you need no figures actually right right and there is a third example uh, oh, always totally no, that's the oh I see it doesn't even have the accidental yeah thing. Oh, yeah that's awesome and how how far does Dondrio go I mean does it include nines and and yeah and exactly it's very comprehensive yes every example has one figure more so <laughs> then there's the six coming the five six and so on it's really very systematic uh so so would you say now that's a question i have so should beginners start with four voices or uh, or you know i've heard some 
teachers like to have some diminution, even at the beginning, simple two voice things. Do you think it's good? What's your perspective on that? If you were to teach, should someone start with big chords with chords right away? I think personally, I would start with four voices, but I would understand also other uh, methods. I work well with four voices, but it might might be uh, personal. That's great. Okay, so I I must get that book by <laughs> by uh, <laughs> Christensen. It looks like a great book. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me t- let's talk more about you. So you studied. If I'm hearing you right, you did master classes with Professor Lutz. Um, yes. but, but you actually worked one-on-one with Professor De Vries, right? Is that right? Did you take the private lesson? No, no, I, I was going twice to master classes. Okay. Uh, him. uh, actually relatively recently. Uh, and this was really interesting because he was, um, showing a method, which was as systematic as the book by Dandrieu going step by step, um, making things more and more um, difficult by by adding always one little thing. He starts directly with a melody to harmonize. So it's oh. um, really more an organist um, approach. Like, and you're uh, an organist compre- too, right? You're, you're a harpsichord, yes. but you also play organ too. Yes. Okay. Actually, I started my organ studies quite late. Okay. So that's why I always mentioned only the harpsichord. I uh, learned uh, to play the organ while I was already studying in at Scola. That's also why one reason why um, probably I was never at a master class uh, with uh, Zitze de Vries before. Mm. And... The surrounding for improvisation at Skola is really great uh, because there are many teachers and many ideas. But what what was really special with with, uh, Zitze de Ries is to go really step by step, which I've never seen like that before. This was really a a great discovery. One thing he told me was that uh, if... For him, it was usually the case if somebody was good at improvisation, they usually started young. He he usually he said that to me, and um and or they 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 picked it up and they were doing it for a long time. Um, do you find that's that's the case? Improvisation needs time. You really need time to get better in it. You you just it's it's a it's a period of of time. It's it's hard. Maybe it's hard. It's easy to start it, but you know, it takes time to really get good at it. Absolutely. It takes a lot of time to be really good in, um, in every sense of the, the word. There is, for instance, the, the aspect of getting good ideas, but it should be also so fluent. One has to, to keep concentrated. Mm. Uh, uh, good keyboard technique. I mean, there are so many aspects. Um, I think it, it needs a lot of time. Often I'm quite happy if I show some something to somebody, some improvisation technique. People understand quite often techniques quite fast, but then to come from this first step of understanding to a situation where one can really make a piece on 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 the spot. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. Um, how much? How like this is a this might be a simple question, but how much time would you dedicate to practicing improvisation a day? Like how like how much like you also have to practice repertoire, I believe, right? But also Absolutely. like how do you split it up? It's. Uh, a quite co- a difficult question because it depends really on, um, for instance, what the next concert is about. But I think I I take more or less one fourth to one third of my practicing time for improvisation. I I would say. 
which depends very much on on the program what it means oh that's awesome um now we should talk a little bit about um imp- what maybe maybe we can try something uh, you have your instrument there right yes now i know here's the thing you can go with zero to 60 you can improvise fugues which is already a <laughs> uh, very high level now i was wondering maybe before fugues a few steps before that can you ex- ex- elaborate what you meant by like progressive steps of improvisation maybe what's like the simplest thing somebody should learn if they were going to start improv- improvising and let's say eventually the final end is a fugue but like before all of that like what should they do to start to lay the ground for this if the goal is or if one goal from the beginning on is to make fugues i would start really with exercises which really prepare the fugue. For instance, um, one thing which is very easy on the paper, but actually difficult to do if one never did it, is if you have an invertible counterpoint, which is already written, to just invert it, which means the left hand plays the right and this needs just some some time to understand so i would for instance uh, i developed a kind of uh, a fugue theme which one can could even use as a total beginner with a kind of double counterpoint to it and this could be already a first step of a fugue for instance if the theme is One easy counterpoint to this could be, and this is already great because you have a suspension, you have a seventh, which is resolved to a sixth. Um, One even doesn't necessarily need to explain everything of that to to a student at this point. One could, but Maybe it's also just nice to try and to, to experience that. And then one would need, I have now these voices in this uh, constellation, so the theme which I presented, with a voice added on top of that. And now I could ask, could you play the theme in the upper voice? So it is which Mm. takes already a kind of thinking which is already counterpoint. For you, is counterpoint something that is uh, like a written thing or do you like to have counterpoint always? Like like what's your, your, what's your understanding of counterpoint? I mean, you, you're an improviser. Do you, does it, is it more of a thing that's alive and or something you play with and manipulate? Counterpoint is actually a, a terrible word because in many traditions it had other implications. For instance, in the 16th century, it was mainly seen as something to be sung. So a teacher would sing one voice and ask the, the student to make uh, some interval to that, for instance, six parallels. So actually counterpoint was also kind of a singing school or something like that. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, so different. Is, it, it, it's so strange actually. And um, now it's a little bit everything or nothing. It is mm. or a, vo- mm. a piece with many voices which are very independent or, or whatever it's it's actually a terrible word because it can <laughs> mean so many things uh, but i think it can be something to practice almost like uh, the singing exercises uh, they did in the 16th century um, and in in spain there was a, a huge tradition of those um, um, singings or uh, singing on uh, cantus firmus. Uh, 
I couldn't say what it means exactly for me, <laughs> <laughs> but it is uh, uh, definitely something one can practice in s such little formulas. And I think those formulas are very useful to get some uh, really physical understanding of those more than understanding on the paper, which is uh, great as well. Well, you talked about simple things, right? Where do you get these simple things from? Do you get them, these simple exercises, simple subjects, simple melodies? Uh, where would you, where would you uh, obtain them from? I would look in repertoire. There, there are things which come again and again, like sequences, for instance. I would try to simplify them and... Um, actually, it's what uh, the research on Patimento has uh, done a lot to gi give uh, names to the, the different sequences to say it's uh, a Romanesca, it's uh, a Galant Romanesca or whatever. It's, um, it's really this kind of work of understanding some formula, then to practice the formula and then to apply it, to change it also maybe. Now, I'm very interested in Bach. Now, Bach is, can you talk a little bit about the sorts of sources that he used to become such a great musician? He used really an incredible amount of different scores and also of different uh, uh, styles of scores. For instance, he uh, copied French organ music by uh, Nicolas de Grigny, or he copied Italian Concertus, he transcribed those concertos. What's very interesting, uh, at least to me, to look at is how he copied it. When he copied the French scores, he kept the original clefs, which were very uncommon in uh, Germany, uh, uh, F clef on the third line, for instance. So oh. it was almost like making... Uh, 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 a urtext edition, which <laughs> is very, very great for for us uh, uh, early musicians today to to see that such a, an approach was possible back then. But in the, at the same time, the Italian concertos were transcribed uh, uh, in a quite drastic way. He took violin concertos and turned them to organ solo pieces or harpsichord solo pieces. So it's very interesting what he did. And well, you, Wait, hold on a second. You mentioned a name. Uh, just sorry to, to interrupt, but there was a Nicolas de, de Grigny. Uh, de Grigny, yes. De Grigny. Uh, who was this? I've never heard the name before. Could you just quickly talk about him? Was he a significant composer? Was he? Tell me about his music and his life a little bit. He is a um, very special composer because organists today know him very well and organists believe that the whole world knows him, but actually only organists know him. <laughs> and <laughs> this is not an exaggeration. He wrote, as far as, uh, as far as I know, only organ music or only organ music survived. Um he is definitely a very important composer because his organ works are, um, are so well written and also so um, complex. It got a complexity which was very uncommon in France. Uh, oh, wow. It, he lived, he did not live a long life. He lived no, like he, he, 31 years. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's like that's that's even worse than Mozart. Yeah. Wow. He died early, and he left also much less music than Mozart. But um, his organ music is very fascinating, and it must have been also to Bach because uh, it has very difficult pedal parts, and it's also harmonically, and the counterpoint is also very complex. So I'm absolutely not surprised uh, that Bach was interested and wrote, uh, copied the whole uh, organ book, which was printed already. Bach copied it by hand, nevertheless. 
Wow, that's 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 really awesome. Now, sorry, I interrupted you. Um, you were talking about his influences. Yes, Bach's influences are very interesting uh, because in uh, Germany in this time, there was a lot of uh, French music and Italian music. When Bach was young, uh, the Vivaldi concerti arrived ju just had arrived in Germany and this created a real um, big revolution because solo concerti didn't really exist before and now it was uh, the thing to do and just before French style with music from the generation of Nicolas de Grigny had been very important also in uh, Germany so there were a lot of influences and at the same time, there were those German organists like uh, Buxtehude or, or, or Böhm or many others who were just making counterpoint, improvising on the organ, which was maybe the, the uh, German thing. So it was a lot going on there. And... Um, and uh, a lot of possible influences to take for Bach, M many more than he would have had if he would have been in uh, another country in this time. That's really fascinating. Now, um, yeah. there are a few names uh, like Nicholas Bruns. Did I say that right? Uh, yeah. Now, that, who, who is that? He is another typical organ composer because he is mainly known to organists today a little bit like uh, the Grigny he died very young he um, brought very fascinating organ music when I listened to it first I was surprised because it's 17th century music but there are many diminished chords and uh, at the same time, it's uh, also a lot of counterpoint. It's really reminding a bit of Bach, but it can't because it's before. So it's also very, very fascinating. Wow. I've never heard of these <laughs> names. Wow, there's yeah. so many great musicians that that, yeah. that preceded Bach. And again, look at this, thir 19, oh, sorry. 1665 to 1697, he, he didn't live very long too. And he was no. one of the most prominent organists and composers of his generation. Wow, that's incredible. So wait, what? Okay, I got to ask you, what's the difference between um, the Northern School and the Southern School in terms of like keyboard works? It's a very uh, fascinating difference because... In northern uh, Germany, they were building those huge organs with up to four manuals and a huge pedal board with many stops in the pedal. So organists could really play pedal solos just with their feet and it will fill the whole church. At the same time, in um, southern Germany, they didn't have uh, similar organs. They had, for instance, smaller pedal boards. They had a very different um, approach to the stops because the uh, northern organs were very colorful and the southern ones had more um, stops at the same pitch, eight-foot stops, which were more like having smaller differences but more subtle. So it was really a completely un other understanding of the instrument and of the music, of course. Um, at the same time, the influence of um, toccatas, like uh, still from the time of Frescobaldi with this, these parts, which alternate with different characters, was very much present in the whole uh, 17th century. So, um, for instance, a prelude of Books of Hood the, would have a very um, similar form to have alternating parts with very different characters and sometimes 
going from un one into the other. At the same time, in the um, southern uh, German school, similar things were taken also from uh, those very old Italian things. Um, but it's very interesting to see which parts of uh, Frescobaldi was abandoned at some time, maybe in the north, but not in the south or the opposite. So it was really um, coming from the same ideas, but going uh, different ways. Right. Who are your favorite composers from the 17th century? In terms of, I guess, maybe for keyboard works. It's a very good question. Um, I really like uh, the keyboard works of Buxtehude. And um, I also like a lot the more southern um, uh, organ style with Georg Muffat. Mm. So actually, these are very... Um, different uh, uh, kinds of music, but I'm more into the Northern German style. It's also interesting to see that um, Bach was actually part of a central German style, which was a little bit uh, having aspects of both. Yeah, which, so is he claimed <laughs> by, any, by North or South, or you're saying he's actually of his own kind of central style? Yeah, the central German style was also very interesting because it was uh, the the um, uh, where was he Lazar Leipzig? Was he Le Leipzig? Is that right? Where yes, he lived? The, I got to see this Leipzig. on the map. <laughs> was uh, he he was born in Eisenach and okay. uh, he died in Leipzig and. Um, this central German style was a bit in between because at the same time uh, they were Lutheran and not Catholic so they were oriented more to the north but okay uh, I'd say. yes there were incredible links also to the south because people like uh, Pachelbel uh, moved a little bit he was uh, living sometime in, in Erfurt which is uh, also in central uh, Germany, but he was also active in the south. Oh, so airfoot, okay. Yeah, exactly. So there were incredible links also to the south, and at the sa same time, the organs were a little bit in between as well. They had some northern uh, characteristics, but at the same time, they had smaller pedal boards like in the south so it was really a bit uh, i mean with less stops so the pedals would make a less impressive effect if you play a uh, organ solo for instance so it's mm. really a bit a uh, uh, situation in between now where, where did, he, did i heard some story where he walked for like uh just <laughs> he walked all the way to see Buxtehude, is that is that right? Did I get the right person? And where where, where did he go? It's uh, actually it's it's probably a legend because it's uh, Forkel in the first Bach oh. biography, uh, which was written in I think eighteen o two. Who claims that he had contact with C. P. Bach uh, and Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, but. Uh, we don't know exactly where he takes that fro from. It's a bit difficult because uh, we don't know who told him, him that. Okay, um, but let's let's say it was true. Yeah. Wh wh what town did he walk to? And so he was from Leipzig, and he walked to another town. Mm -hmm. No, he was uh, he was not in Leipzig at this time. He ended in Leipzig uh, much later in his career. He was in. Arnstadt. Okay, where is that? Which is uh, which is uh, close to Erfurt, I think. Arnstadt. Oops. Oops. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Wait. Let me let me get, let me zoom out again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. A R N S T. 
see. Onstad. Okay, I, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. He was here. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, and, the, and where did he, he walk to? To to Lübeck, which is at the uh, at the sea. It's really on. Whoa, uh, what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, he went from he went from here. All, he walked all the way from here to there. If that if the legend is true, right? Yes, but it's wow. unlike. Unlikely. Because okay, he was nice. already organist and he could have afforded to travel uh, could in have a taken carrier. Transportation, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but well, that's that's awesome. Okay, so the, the Northern and the Southern style. Hey, Leonard, maybe we should, uh, just to switch things up, do you want to play something? What do you think? you want to have a little uh, playing on the harpsichord? Do you have any ideas of what you want to play? I could... Improvise a fugue where I could show uh, the formulas which I showed before, for instance. That sounds great. So I repeat the formula and then I show one way to make a diminution of the formula and then I make a fugue out of it. Okay. The formula was with its counterpoint, it was. And to make it a little bit less dry, I make the formula a bit nicer. Was awesome that was so good i'm so glad that people are still doing this today i mean thank, thank goodness <laughs> that we're maintaining this amazing tradition i mean oh that was awesome okay maybe we should unpack that a little bit so could you just describe i mean obviously when you improvise it's your your thinking in the moment and maybe you might not remember everything you did but maybe do you want to just unpack kind of describe uh what you did there Yes, um, to understand the principle, first of all, is important to learn the craft. But at some point, indeed, one is so much used to that, that it could work also automatically. So uh, what I did was that I'm, I got uh, familiar with the formula, which I showed you, which was now in the form of this motif. <laughs> And with a counterpoint which fits to it, and um, I practiced also a, lo a long time to similar motifs. I don't know if exactly this one. I don't think so. But to uh, to have that in one hand, just to have so I have it in one hand. The other one is not playing, and so it's free. It could be used to to add another voice. How it could work, it has to be practiced, but it, one can find, for instance, here one could use the um, basically a cadence. So mm -hmm. to make this, here it fits perfectly to have just. So to, to get familiar with those uh, formulas is essential then to to be able to 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 improvise and 
to to see already on the spot this uh, is actually a part of this formula so I can turn it into that shape right that's 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 very very helpful and um, I have a few questions now so the first question is what sort of beginner fugues do you like to look at in the literature I mean does it go without saying that it's good to look at box fugues? Uh, but I've heard people say that that some of his stuff is a little bit over the top, very complicated. It might be better to look at some simpler ones first. Uh, what do you have to say about that? I think that his fugues are, are too complex, not only because they are complex, but also because uh, each one is very individual and you might look at one and you might think, now I understood this and you look at the next one and this is not the same anymore at all. So it's it can be really uh, too much. Maybe it's better to look, for instance, in the at the Fuchs by Pachelbel, which um, more which are, are more simple and also in some way more expedient because uh, it's it's easier to understand uh, the working uh, behind. How just can I just ask how many fugues from the repertoire have you played? Uh, I've played uh, many fugues. I didn't count them. I played the <laughs> whole first book of. Uh, of Bach's uh, fugues in all the keys so it's a lot and then organ fugues and uh, other composers and from the second book okay, some you, met, you mentioned Pachelbel <laughs> is there more yeah. composers just just mention them because I, I would like to investigate yeah I think he is probably the best to start with there are some very small fugues by uh, uh, for the Magnificat, for instance, by Gottlieb Muffat, I'm, which is the son of Georg Muffat. Um, okay. Those fugues are um, musically maybe not that interesting, but they are nice because you have basically only uh, exposition of the of the themes, and then it stops already, and it's quite simple. So. It's just uh, very little information, but useful information. And then one can build up on that. Then the Northern German organ fugues tend to be more complex, but one can also look at them. There is, um, for instance, in the G minor prelude and fugue, and postlude by Georg Böhm. There is a very nice fugue in the middle, which is um, useful because it's uh, based on, on on standard motifs. Um, those by the organ fugues by Buxtehude uh, and um, and and Bruns are maybe a bit more complex already. Maybe nice is a further step to look at. Um, do you do the? This is, I mean, see, this shows how little I know. Do you do the French write fugues? Do the obviously the Italians write fugues? Do you ever look at those uh, or uh, of other nationalities? Sure, uh, the French wrote fugues, but those are very different. And uh, I took also some time practicing. French style organ fugues. Actually, uh, for the French, it was really part of the organ music, not uh, of the harpsichord music. Uh, a interesting difference to Germany, where it exists just everywhere. Um, those French fugues are very nice. And uh, who are the who are the composers? Nicolas de Grigny, uh, oh, okay. Louis uh, Couperin, who is the uncle of François Couperin, for instance, um, and um, Guillaume Gabriel Niver. There are quite quite some composers who wrote fugues, which are very interesting. 
because it's um, often less about making really strict counterpoint, but it's more about having an, a kind of color of counterpoint. It's more free, but at the same time, it's not necessarily easier than the German style fugues. Uh, to to copy as improvisation because they use less obvious formulas, which I showed now with the invertible counterpoint is a very obvious formula which you can find in similar ways in quite many fugues, also by Bach and and very complex music. So you you can be very happy to find those things again in in things which seem so incredibly. Uh, uh, difficult. But in French music this exists as well, of course, but it's a bit more hidden and um, that's why I say it's not necessarily uh, easier. Mm. Um, okay. I know this person from history a little bit and uh, Louis Marchand, is that right? Ah, yeah. So Now, okay, so they say that I mean, historically, that he had a he ran away from a contest from Bach. I mean, that's legendary, maybe. I think that's probably legendary. But I mean, still, people then say, "Oh, he's terrible because Bach is so awesome." But can you you have you played his works? Uh, can you assess him as a composer? Clearly, Bach knew his works, right? Yes. Um, actually, it's not impossible that it took place. The, 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 I was quite surprised, but there are uh, more than one report of that. But his music is definitely interesting. Um, he has, for instance, a prelude in... Um, he ha has published a big suite for harpsichord with, at the beginning, a prelude in, in D minor, which has an incredible beginning. So he starts with... So he starts with the C sharp to go up a scale to C, C uh, 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 natural, and then it's to to have this actually, but it's an incredible uh, surprise. And he he is the guy who had this idea, so it's really nice. Uh, he wrote really nice keyboard music and this kind of false relations, like here the actually uh, diminished octave, which is not directly at the same time, of course, but you clearly hear it. So it's, it's re really interesting music, and it's quite sad that he is only remembered in comparison to Bach, which is also unfair because his music is very different to Bach's. Right. I mean, that's like Salieri and Mozart. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, but so, no, we can fix that. So this guy was awesome. And I think people should check yeah. out his music, right? Uh, but probably, I mean, usually if there's stories like that, there's usually like gossip that he was probably might quite have been a character. So he might have been kind of a, a difficult yes. character to deal with. So maybe, you know, people don't like that and then they make nasty stories. Um, but he, I guess he was a very skill. He, I guess you cannot deny that he was quite a skillful person then, right, on, on the keyboard. Yeah. So that that's definitely worth checking out his music. Um, okay, there's a big topic that I, I do want to talk about, and um, that is tuning and temperaments. Um, I love to ask harpsichordists and early music experts on this. Um, so <laughs> I, I just every every time I, it uh, th that comes about, there's always like ah yeah. equal temperament. But <laughs> but I know that. Um, can you explain to me like um, like equal, uh, some of the tunings that are used and um, is that something you are very familiar with? Like like are you so used to using interesting temperaments? Because I know it's not uniform even at that time. People use different temperaments, right? Um, and yep. different tuning. So uh, can you maybe unpack uh, your perspective on, on temperaments and tuning? So actually, um, the, the whole <laughs> development which took time in uh, Bach's time can be uh, summed up very uh, fast. There was mean tone where some chosen thirds were totally pure 
and others are impossible to use. And um, actually, this doesn't allow to play many keys, but those which are playable are just perfect, at least in the perspective of the third. The fifth is very small, but this was not seen as a problem. Uh, then, of course, it's uh, the thirds which don't work at all were a huge problem, so people were looking for other possibilities. Actually, one of the first alternatives to be proposed was, of course, equal temperament, because it's very easy to explain every interval the same. Mm. Uh, it would solve all the problems, but people uh, didn't necessarily like it. So, but it was an option from the beginning on. So, already, so it actually has a history. It's not a very. Yeah. It's, it's it's it extends back. People have yeah. used it even a while back then. Yeah, in 16th century, it was already described, but it was not the the standard. And then, temperaments uh, were. Actually actually just um, trying to get away from mean tone to something which is, comes closer to equal temperament to some degree which could vary a lot. Mm. And in Bach's time, um, and already in the 17th century, many experiments um, existed and actually... Um, the perfect thirds and the dissonance, which are very dissonant, for instance, uh, um, diminished fourth in in mean tone, a C sharp is really a C sharp. It's not just the black key, which is between the C and the D, <laughs> a D flat. So actually, that, the that's what I think. Yeah, I just I guess it is. There's a different sound to it. It's a unique yeah. sound, right? Exactly. The C sharp to the F is supposed to be a ugly interval in mean tone. So mm. actually, uh, a lot of 17th century composers used a lot of um, augmented chords, which include necessarily a, a diminished fourth or a, an augmented fifth somewhere. And those dissonances sound much more expressive in mean tone. Much more striking. So, now, what, what is your harpsichord yeah. tuned to right now? Now it's a kind of um, um, unequal temperament which comes relatively close to equal temperament. So it's okay. not a, a good place to, to show, show To it demonstrate now. some but striking if, uh, dissonances. You have, yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't now. Um, but could you give some examples? Yeah, so you mentioned certain intervals. So, like, what keys would people use uh, uh, for for some of these to demonstrate some of these interesting kind of dissonances? Actually, um, there were good notes which were tuned according what one uh, expects to be useful. For instance, a C sharp is more useful than a D flat, so you should tune C sharp. Uh, G sharp in 17th century was uh, considered more useful than uh, A flat, so you would tune uh, G sharp. So you should just not use the G sharp as the A flat, because that's that's a real mistake. Um, then the dissonances which you create with the keys, which are still right, for instance. The, the augmented the, the, the um, augmented fourth for instance uh, those are supposed to be um, uh, to sound wrong for instance if you <laughs> play a C sharp and a F it will not be a beautiful third at all and this is supposed to be like that oh. so actually you could even play in A major if there is never a, a D sharp for instance because it's in the good keys. Um, this is something which got a bit lost with equal temperament. And I'm, uh, if the music is older, I'm more aware of it, of course, if, as if it's later music. Um, Bach also, outside of his 24 prelude in fugue, he could write a piece in F minor, which is also already a very 
far uh, strange key. So of course one has to to tune the keyboard in a way which comes closer to equal time Berman. Mm. And I think that the composition techniques of Bach are in a way that this is, makes already less of a compositional difference. If I play 17th century music, I'm very sad with those more modern temperaments. Mm. It has a strong influence on, on, on uh, my playing and also on my improvisations. It will, will also uh, uh, give me naturally the um, wish to improvise in a more old-fashioned style if the, the keyboard is perfect mean tone. Right, and and I think that's what Professor De Vries said. I think in our interview, he said something like, "The instrument gives you ideas, right?" Absolutely, and he is totally right. He is playing a lot on original historical organs. I think for an early musician, it's also important to look for the originals, not only playing on copies because they have a lot to say as well. Those original instruments. And uh, and it's absolutely right. The instrument tells a lot. It's it has been built and designed for a certain taste, which is um, and to a different uh, um, very special special tradition. And um, to get into the style really of the tradition is. Um, uh, it's really useful to, to uh, play yeah, that, on the... That makes a lot of sense. That makes a ton of sense. So so basically, if I take a 17th century keyboard piece and I go to my digital keyboard, which is equal temperament, I've kind of lost a lot of the sound yeah. and I've lost a lot of the things in translation because they compose with the temperaments in mind and never mind that it's not even a real instrument. It's it's like the tuning, the the fact that it's equal, just like it's like strips away a lot of the character. Yes, and that makes a lot, a lot of, of the expression, which is in the music, get lost. Right. Other in, uh, things which you could use to to put expression into music uh, will not work if you do it on the historical instrument. For instance, diminished chords sound often very strange on metone temperament. So, right, and, right. and that's maybe a reason why in 17th century, there are quite few diminished chords if you compare it to the next mm. generations. Right, right. That, that makes a ton of sense. Now, this is a, okay, obviously this is blasphemy, but if I have asked, <laughs> if I said to an early musician, what if I had an electronic keyboard that with a press of a button gives you a different temperament sampled? Would that be heresy or would, would that, uh, is that, is that like you wouldn't rather not do that? I would say it would even solve all the problems of temperaments, but uh, I would still be very unhappy because all those instruments have so many more characteristics than the temperament, um, the the sound. For instance, some uh, harpsichords have a sound which is very long and uh, disappearing more slowly. My, more, uh, some are more crispy and disappearing fast, for instance. And this, you could imitate it with an electronic keyboard, which makes everything you want by pressing the button. But... It's much more complex because it's also about the acoustic which, uh, of the room which react to the instrument. So yeah. it's incredibly complex. No, that makes a lot of sense. I understand. I'm, yeah, I understand. Uh, okay, so final couple of questions. Um, best, okay, I guess you did answer Don Ryu. Best way to learn General Bass, Don Ryu, Christensen. Uh, best way to learn counterpoint, like really getting good at written counterpoint for compositions, for written counterpoints. How? What is a good way to develop that? Um, I don't have really a book to propose for that, but uh, I would 
I would make a huge difference about if you want to to write music or um, understand compositions or if you want to improvise. If it's about understanding music, I would come uh, much earlier already with rules which explain things and then showing exact uh, exceptions. If it's about improvisation, I would I would rather have an approach of showing now do exactly this as I show it and then here you have another variant and then maybe at some point you can already play a piece but you have for every possibility only one variant so it's not a real improvisation and then I would start to to say uh, look here you had this variant but you could also have done that and then it could comes already a bit into the direction of improvisation. But the approach is much less based on rules, but more on um, on figures, which are learned step by step. It's like, um, I would teach improvisation more like a language. Maybe you learn already the first sentence in the language without knowing any rule, but just repeating what somebody says. But at some point, of course, you need the rules to to get further. Right, right. Okay, that's, that's a good distinction. Now, second question, how does knowing how to improvise affect your interpretation? Now, in the classical world, you're quite a rarity, and even the people at the Scola Contor Contorman, they're rare. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if you take all of the classical music world, I mean, it's... There are very few improvisers. Um, so how does it change the way you look at repertoire and how you perform at a concert? It's changed a lot because um, a very controlled improvisation is already, um, I mean, the intention, the musical intention is already part of the improvisation. Um, to make a long phrase is already playing the long phrase at, as something which has a beginning and an end and not just some notes which are uh, put one after in a, a, another. And for, for many musicians, one has to learn to play musically, to breathe and all those things. But I think if one practices a lot of improvisation, that solves a lot of problems. And um, also it makes that one things much less with time about interpretation because um, breathing at some place, uh, taking time if it sounds very complex to make it understandable to the public, it's, it just gets natural. And then it gets also uh, um, um, hard or, or sad or uncomfortable to, to, to me if I listen to musicians who I think don't understand what they are playing, uh, understand in, in any sense, also senses, also in just... Uh, There's uh, most of them. <laughs> in a pure technical sense, but also in where the phrase begins and stops, uh, they take some musical uh, choices, but I can't understand why or uh, for instance they start to make some little rubato to make it uh, more interesting but actually it's a long sequence which leads somewhere so mm -hmm. if it's mm -hmm. just uh, out something of place. Is, uh, totally out of place it's really not comfortable to li listen to yeah. so actually improvisation definitely teaches to um, to understand what we are playing. Right. right. That's, that's, that's a wonderful explanation of that. And uh, maybe to end off, um, uh, do you have any favorite contemporaries uh, that either are alive or even in the 20th century who might have passed away? Do, are there any recordings that you can recommend that people should check out if they want to improve their sensibility, their sound, uh, good models to listen to? I enjoy a lot listening to Wolfgang Zehra, who 
has been until recently uh, um, organ professor in Skoda, Kanton Brasiliensis. He is still an organ professor in Hamburg. Um, it's really amazing how he plays because uh, I think those are the really little things. For instance, when a sequence starts, he takes a little a bit of time, but not too much to make it not cheap, but just to show now we are going there. And then we understand it's going on, so he doesn't make too much because it's obvious what comes next. So it's really, it's really out of the music. It's not something uh, very strange he adds. or And he is really also interested in the... Uh, meaning of the motifs, especially in organ music. Um, yeah, if it's a symbol of something or if it's a choral melody. So everything is just put there in a very nice way. And uh, I think it's really worth trying to, to do the same because actually it's what I imagine is the the also greatest part of um, of improvisation, but uh, of repertoire as well. It's the the like the result should should be like talking, like uh, natural talking, like explaining. I'm trying to see if there's a video of him playing. Uh, I think so. I think there is there one are, here. There, there uh, are many. Many on YouTube. Okay, I, I think I found one. So. So that's one. Of, does he speak English? I hope he speaks English. Yes, yes. Oh, good. I'd love to talk to him. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> wow, that's 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 really cool. Well, I mean, uh, Leonard. I mean, it's been such a joy to speak to you today, and um, yeah, I feel it has been a pleasure up. to me as well. I feel pumped up to practice. <laughs> I feel Very like good. I need, I need to practice now. Wow, that that's pumped me up. Yo, uh, practicing. It's a great, yeah, I feel fired up. Now, obviously, yeah. people are going to want to go to your website. Uh, maybe they might want to take lessons with you. Um, first yes. first of all, please go to Leonard Cheek's uh, website here and uh, please go to his uh, YouTube channel here. Um, really, I mean, come on. That was amazing what we heard earlier. Uh, really fantastic. And uh, Leonard, do you want to mention any projects or concerts you have in the rest of the year or maybe next year? Any like kind of big things you're working on? Can you clue us in on any like projects you have planned? What's 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 do you have planned for yourself in terms of your next steps? I have some con concerts uh, planned. I am also um, about to put some more on my website. The, the dates are not totally fixed, but uh, it's worth it to to check it because um, some will will come very soon. I think there are three now which are on the website. Yeah, there there are, there are things uh, being planned in uh, Switzerland and in Germany mainly. Wonderful! I I I was so blown away by you playing. Would you be able to play maybe one more thing? Anything you want? Anything you want? Okay, so I will make uh, a, another fugue, maybe on a little bit longer theme.
Live, ladies and gentlemen, live. Now, that is so awesome. Live fugue. I mean, can you believe it? We thought that that was dead, but people are still keeping it going. And the great Leonard Schick, he's uh, wonderful. Please go to his website, subscribe to his YouTube channel. And uh, Leonard, thank you so much for being on the program. It really was a pleasure to have thank you. you. And I, I really hope to have you on again. And because uh, it was really easy, easy conversation for me. So wonderful to talk to a bright young talent and uh, keep going, keep doing what you're doing because it's fantastic. Thank you and um, see you uh, whenever you want. <laughs> I will see you soon. I will hold you to that. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you.